Good morning, everyone. My name is Amanda Lawrence, and I am the project director for the California Master Plan for Aging. Um, today, I'm really pleased that you've chosen to join us for our Ensuring Equity in Aging webinar series. This is our ninth webinar in our series, and today we'll be, we will be discussing culturally responsive programs and services in rural communities. Next slide, please. So today um, you may have opted to join us via webinar or via phone. If you're on the webinar, you will see that we have live captioning as well as American Sign Language interpretation available to you. Um, today's recording, slides, and transcripts will be posted to CDAs online, California for All Ages Equity and Aging Resource Center. Um, we also post the video on YouTube and we will email everyone um, the copies, links to all of these items via our newsletter next week. Next slide. So we have reserved the final 10 minutes for questions and comments from the public. Um, if you're joining by webinar, you can use that Q&A function at any time during the presentation. And you can also click the raise hand button and you can ask your question um, at the end of the session. If you're on the phone, you can join that uh, line by pressing star nine on your dial pad, which will raise your hand so that the moderator knows that you have a question. We'll share these instructions during that Q&A session towards the end of this webinar as well. So as I said, this is our ninth um, Ensuring Equity and Aging webinar. So it's our final webinar in this series, although we, you know, Promise will we'll continue to provide content and resources for aging and disability services providers and those um, in the public health field. Um, we're, we have featured so many fantastic state and local speakers with expertise in the subjects of cultural competency, equity, program, and service delivery over the last nine months. We have focused on Latino older adults, Black and tribal elders, LGBTQ older adults, Asian, Asian Pacific Islander, older adults and also culturally responsive Alzheimer's services. Today, you know, as I said, we will focus on rural environments and how we can provide culturally responsive services in those communities. So as I said, Equity and Aging Resource Center is where we save all of these slides um, and presentations and transcripts. So those will always be there as a continued resource. Um, I may be handing it over to Kim McCoy Wade for introductions. Maria, she has joined as an attendee, so could you please move her over? Kim McCoy Wade is the California Department of Aging Director and has just joined us, and I will hand it over to her. Thank you, Amanda. I'm, I'm looking for Kim in the list. Oh, there she is. Good morning. Good morning. I am thrilled to be joining. May I uh, add my words of welcome? Yes, go ahead. Great. Uh, it's so wonderful to see in the summer and in a, a holiday week for some such terrific turnout, again, a record high to hear from uh, this panel of experts that have been assembled to share with us their expertise on serving a very important part of the California community are rural communities. We are delighted that we have such uh, expertise here in California and that we are lucky to be able to share it with you. Uh, we will be hearing today from Shannon Gad, who I uh, have the privilege of knowing as the Director of Aging in Kentucky before she came here to California to share her gifts. So Shannon Gadd from Mariposa County Health and Human Services Agency uh, is both a colleague and a mentor to me in running a state agency uh, on aging. We're also thrilled to have Seng S. Yang from the Hmong Cultural Center of Butte County. I've always been uh, delighted when I visited Butte to see the multicultural work with the Hmong community, Latino, Spanish speaking community, and uh, a white rural community as well. And Deb Winkle from B B Blue Lake Rancheria, as we at the Department of Aging deepen our historic and our uh, 
uh, moral and our legal uh, partnership with California's tribal organizations in serving the original and first elders of our country and our state. So with the three of you here, I am delighted to listen and learn and look forward to hearing the conversation with all of our colleagues around how we can uh, build back better for uh, rural communities, for and with rural communities and rural elders. Take it away. Hi, um, good morning, everybody. I am Shannon Gadd, and thank you, Kim, for that very kind introduction. Uh, so I, currently, I am the Health and Human Services Agency Director for Mariposa County. I started um, in this position and started in California in October of 2020. Uh, before that, as Kim said, I was the Commissioner for the Kentucky Department for Aging and Independent Living and have been working in the field of aging for almost uh, two decades now. So um, Kim has asked me to provide kind of an overview of rural America. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what Miraposa is you know, on the cusp of doing and planning and then hand it over to our other colleagues. So um, as to, to orient us, um, first let's talk about what is rural? What does that mean? Um, it means different things to different people. Uh, the US Census Bureau has had the same definition of rural um, since 1910, and that it simply means the non-urban population. Um, but I think most of us uh, understand that rural differs greatly. You know, uh, rural Mariposa is very different from, you know, suburban LA, um, even though those could all be considered rural under the Census Bureau definition. So it's important to understand that when we say rural, we're putting a lot of things in the same bucket and we have to think about um, rural communities individually, kind of, you know, using the person-centered um, work that we do when we talk about um, rural communities. So, so that's just kind of an orientation. And you know, on this slide, well, it looks really yellow on this, but it's orange to me. Um, you see uh, the map of rural America. So 97% of the nation's land is considered rural. So that really you know, underscores the, the, the strength, depth, width, all those things of, of rural America. 20% um, of Americans live in rural communities. And of that number, you know, we generally tend to think again of rural America as um, your, your stereotypical, um, you know, majority white uh, population, but our rural communities are diverse and that diversity is growing. You know, as you see, one in five rural Americans identifies as a person of color. And in the last, in, between 2000 and 2010, 83% of the growth in rural America was comprised of people of color, which I, I thought that was pretty astounding. Um, so rural communities do tend to skew older. Uh, of course, that varies by community. Um, I know Mariposa, we, we are very attractive for retirement, um, those who are retiring, uh, those individuals, so, which is great. Um, and our population, as you'll see later, is, excuse, much older uh, than California. So another note that wasn't on the slide is um, the LGBT population in rural communities. You know, again, the stereotype is, well, there aren't any. Um, and that's actually not true at all. So three to 5% of the rural population does identify as LGBT. And that's actually consistent with the US population, which is about 4.5% of that population identifies as LGBT. And rural youth um, are just as likely to identify as LGBT as urban youth. So I thought, again, um, to, to orient us and to get us our, our minds set on the reality and the real numbers of what rural America looks like rather than um, the stereotypes and the myths. So, next slide. 
Okay, so I think I would assume all of us uh, know about social determinants of health. Um, and I wanted to talk about how um, social determinants of health, the challenges that rural communities have in addressing social determinants. So uh, the domains, of course, are economic stability, um, physical environment, education, food and access, uh, community and social context, and of course, the healthcare system. And all of that together leads us to our health outcomes. And when talking about equity, of course, I think all of us understand that um, those that are considered to be minority populations have um, worse health outcomes. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we talk about rural and those um, minorities who live in rural areas. So next slide. Okay, so challenges uh, related to addressing social determinants of health in rural areas. First of all, rural areas uh, are predominantly or more likely to be poor than urban areas. So 18% of rural populations versus less than 16% um, urban. Then when you're talking about minorities, I was really astounded by these numbers, but 62% of rural Black Americans and 53% of rural Hispanic Americans live in poverty. And that is, it's shocking. Um, and, and really, again, orients us to, to the challenges of uh, rural life and the challenges of our minority populations who live in rural areas. So we move on to the physical environment. Um, the, again, this was a astounding number, but the fatality rate for traffic accidents in rural areas is more than two times that of urban areas. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into that, but I know the department, the US Department of Transportation considers 40% of the roads in, in rural areas um, unsafe to travel. It's 40%. That's pretty incredible. And only 60% of rural communities um, in America even have public transportation. And I know we, we have public transport here in Mariposa, but it's difficult, you, you know, fixed route in rural communities, um, that can be very hard depending on the size and, and the geography of, of the community. So education, um, I think, you know, the stereotype is that people in rural areas are less educated than those in urban areas. And that does hold true in the numbers. Um, you know, I know in Mariposa, we don't have um, a college or a community college here. I'd like to, that to change. Um, so access to education is, is difficult in rural areas. Um, Moving on to food, rural communities make up 87% of counties with the highest rates of food insecurity. Again, you've got a lot of factors there, transportation, um, access to healthy foods. Uh, we do have, for example, a farmer's market here in Mariposa, but it's in Mariposa town. Um, and it's about an hour or more to, to the, our county lines. Uh, so not everybody has, has easy access to healthy, fresh foods. Um, the community context, uh, rural women experience domestic violence at higher rates um, than their urban counterparts. Again, a variety of reasons for that, but it kind of sets that context. And something that's been, you know, talked about in the media and certainly in California quite a bit is access to internet. Um, that became you know, starkly uh, apparent in the pandemic when everything had to switch online. Um, and, you know, 53% of rural Americans lack that very, very basic access um, to internet. And I know, you know, here in Mariposa, um, I, I didn't have any internet or um, cellular service when, when I moved here. That was surprising. Uh, but it's it's extremely difficult to to connect, and there's lots of barriers, um, the geography uh, and the mountains. It's very difficult to move a, a mountain um, that present challenges for for all of the folks that that we serve. Then the healthcare system, uh, then just the simply the number of providers available in rural areas is tremendously skewed. Uh, those numbers of physicians that's not a typo. 
Uh, physicians per 10,000 people, 13 rural versus 31 urban. And 65% of rural counties don't have a psychiatrist at all. Um, and when you think about mental health in rural communities, uh, the suicide rate in rural communities is 54% higher than in our urban communities. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, it, there. So rural areas in general fare worse than urban areas in all of our health outcomes, you know, higher mortality rate, morbidity rate, lower life expectancy, um, healthcare expenditures are higher, uh, health status is rated lower, there's more functional limitations. It sounds very dire, doesn't it? Um, but, but it's not, you know, rural communities have a lot of, of positive things, but, you know, rural communities suffer from decades upon decades of being under-resourced. Um, this is something I actually had personal experience in, in my last position serving as the commissioner for the Kentucky Department for Aging. Um, I think if we're in this webinar, I think most people know about the interstate funding formula under the Older Americans Act. And you know it's prescribed in the Older Americans Act what things can be considered in the interstate uh, funding formula. And the challenge I was presented um, is there are rural area agencies on aging in Kentucky were just horribly under-resourced. Um, and I tried just about every calculation I could think of to figure out how to shift that funding formula to provide more resources to our rural counties um, in Kentucky. And there was nothing I could do to, to make it happen, to make it equitable for rural communities versus our urban communities. Um, I tried, I tried everything I could think of. But you know, these funding formulas that come down from the from the federal government, um, they don't consider the the challenges of rural life um, and the challenges of you know being under resourced and I know um, in many rural communities here in California the health and human services agencies um, are kind of the be all end all uh, there aren't a lot of nonprofits and CBOs you can turn to so um, it's it's just incredibly challenging um, but there's a lot of beauty here in the people and in the landscape um, and a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of people committed to do that work. So uh, next slide. So Mariposa County, uh, just to give you an example, so this is us, um, you know, our demographics, again, every rural community is different, but our demographics are 91% white, 2% um, African-American, and you can see how that compares to the rest of the state. 37% uh, of Mariposans are 60 plus. So I told you we skewed higher um, when it comes to our older age range. That makes me excited because I love working in the aging field. So I'm very excited by this, but 37% are 60 plus um, and 21% of Mariposans have a disability. Uh, so that gives you kind of an orientation to what one rural community looks like. And we do have almost double the number, uh, the percentage of veterans, as does the state. So we have a significant veteran population as well. So next slide. So as I said, um, we don't have any, you know, fabulous programs that our other speakers have uh, yet in addressing equity. Um, but in, you know, in 2019, this county consolidated three different departments to become Health and Human Services. And I wasn't here for that, but I think that does position us um, to better address equity. Uh, you know, it's easier to have no wrong door when you have less doors <laughs> for people to, to come through. So I think that does position us well to, to launch uh, from there. The pandemic uh, did provide us a lot of opportunities to engage diverse populations. Um, you know, I, I thought with the vaccination clinics, um, when do we have the opportunity to be face to face with nearly everyone um, in our community? So in that, we uh, did surveys at each of our vaccination clinics. So we got a cross section of the county population uh, got their feedback on on their challenges and their needs. So that was that was one thing that we did. Uh, we did have mobile teams to go 
visit our homebound population and um, our homeless population. We co-located our eligibility staff with our public health teams for all of the vaccination clinics and continue to do so. Uh, that was amazing. And the number of contacts the eligibility staff had with, again, um, anyone who attended a vaccination clinic, no matter their background, was in the thousands. Um, so, you know, with that 15 minute wait after being vaccinated, our eligibility staff were able to provide people information and um, get them hooked up with benefits if, if need be. We also had Spanish speaking clinics and luckily we have some Spanish speaking eligibility staff as well. So we co-located them. Um, we were very fortunate to identify a couple of advocates in our Spanish speaking community. Um, it's, it's my understanding and experience that with these small um, minority communities, it's fa fantastic to have those advocates who can break down some walls and barriers. You know, I, I'm always cognizant that we're government, you know, coming into um, a, a community that doesn't necessarily have um, a positive history with government agencies. So having that connection with advocates who can who can you know, introduce us and um, I think is, is key. So we were fortunate to have that as well. Uh, another opportunity presented itself recently in uh, the, our county's first ever Pride event. Um, that was just a couple of weeks ago, actually. I'm uh, really excited about that. And our, our team set up a booth and you know, did the whole, the vendor thing. And it turned out we were the only government agency that attended um, the Pride event, which is a little bit of a bummer. Um, but we did receive really great feedback from the community who attended the event uh, that they were, they were excited that a government agency was there and um, felt you know, it, it just helped us a little bit more to build that relationship uh, with that um, with the LGBTQ community. And again, not no one event is going to magically change a relationship. I believe it's all those little building blocks. Um, so that was one of the building blocks for that community. One thing that I always think of when I think about equity is our more um, frontier locations. In our community in particular, uh, we have about 17,000 in our county, 17,000 um, population, and only 2,000 live in kind of the, the town proper uh, where all of the resources are located. So the vast majority of our community is in, you know, kind of the far flung areas. And I think about equity for them, um, North County, Coulterville, if people are familiar with that area, El Portal, um, which are where our Spanish speaking community is located. I, I really think about equity for them. You know, um, they don't have grocery stores there. They certainly don't have um, social services. There is going to be a new clinic that's opening up in North County. So I do think about equity as far as how they're able to access services. And that's something that we're gonna continue to look at. Uh, so, that's where we are in Mariposa, kind of at, at the beginning of the equity conversation. And I will turn it back over to, I guess, Amanda, um, and we'll go with our, our other programs. So thank you everybody, uh, glad to be here and hope that was helpful for our discussion. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, so wonderful to hear about previous work and stats and the rural landscape and then work to come. I am gonna go ahead and pass it on to our next speaker. That would be Deb Winkle from Blue Lake Rancheria in Humboldt County. Take it away, Deb. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, my name is Deb Winkle, as she stated, but, and I've been the Title VI uh, Elders Food Program Director here at Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe for five years, but I've been in the uh, um, cooking industry for over 20. And it's just a real honor to be here to be able to help the elders in our rural, rural um, county here in Humboldt and Trinity counties. So um, here's a video on some of the background of the tribe. 
The, the program, the elders food program was developed about 35 years ago when the tribe um, identified a need for the rural areas to be able to have um, consistent and healthy foods to be able to be delivered to their homes because many are uh, shut in and, and can't get to the grocery store or things like that. So here's a uh, another short video on uh, the background of the food program. Food is prepared here in the tribal commercial kitchen and we use standardized recipes so to be able to know the exact amount of ingredients for the amount of servings that we want to serve and we usually the meals that we usually cook is 150 meals per day so that's 700 meals a week that uh, we produce. Using the standardized recipes that uh, cuts down on the food waste of either ordering too much or having too much left over. Uh, you can figure out exactly how many servings that you need for the, the amount of food that you need to purchase so that there would be less waste in the production of the food and also afterwards. Temperatures are taken during um, cooking and also afterwards to make sure that they're in the, the safe zones. And after cooking the large portions, we um, separate them out into uh, smaller containers and put them in the refrigerator so that they can cool down. And then the volunteers that I usually have will uh, dish them up into the, the serving trays for the frozen meals. After we dish them up, we set them on the conveyor belt. There's 10 that'll fit at one time. And then when you turn it on, there's a, a volunteer at the other end that'll take them off and put them on the tray so that they can be prepared to, to go into the freezer. Delivery of the meals for the elders that are homebound. Um, we have a, an ice truck, refrigerated truck that we uh, we take out, and it has its um, ice box on there that's all also uh, monitored. The temperature is monitored, so it stays at zero. The areas that we serve were fairly uh, rural in in aspect and the elders are not able to get to the store to buy groceries and um, a lot of the elders are homebound and they can't get out as easy or it's uh, very difficult for them to get to where they need to go to get services and some of them are not able to uh, fix their meals themselves because of their in medical issues or just they're just fragile and, and frail. Elders Meals, the Title VI program, uh, helps cut down on the insecurity for the elders to be able to bring them good quality food door-to-door um, -door for those that are not able to get out. And then it also provides welfare checks for the elders because the driver is able to uh, speak with them and, and help them you know, put their meals in their freezer for them or things like that. And prior to the pandemic, we would deliver every week on Tuesdays. and. Uh, but since the pandemic hit and we didn't want to uh, expose the elders to 
any more things than necessary and also my driver because he is also 60 plus and he's a, a volunteer um, I wanted to keep him safe also and so now during the pandemic we went to uh, delivering three weeks worth of meals every three weeks Great. so then that way it cuts down on the exposure to, to everybody There's several people that will call the tribal office to find out about our food program or the Senior Resource Center will refer people to our, our program if they're not able to take them on their Meals of Wheels program. And then there's always, always the end of year uh, elders luncheon where we invite um, elders to come and just, just bless them for, you know, with traditional meals. And from time to time we get uh, donations. Uh, of uh, cultural foods as uh, venison or we've had elk also and some salmon and just recently we were provided with uh, some uh, black cod for the elders and uh, it came in at a time that we could uh, send it out with our meal delivery and so I got some positive re responses back with that that uh, the elders really enjoyed it. So it's really important uh, for the elders to be able to uh, come and socialize and, and be together. But when the pandemic hit, we had to close the, uh, the eating, the dining facility at the tribal office. Um, but that's a great place for the elders to come and get a hot meal every day of the week, Monday through Friday, and just have a time to socialize with uh, uh, their counterparts and things. And hopefully here in the near future, we'll be able to open the the congregate site so that the elders can start coming back and having a, a hot meal every day. The Blue Lake Rancheria, we have a, a community garden and we also have a goal to reach uh, zero carbon emissions by 2030. And uh, our food program uses the fresh produce from the, from the garden for the elders meals and then whatever is not able to use the like the peelings and such as that we save it for compost and then it's sent out um, over to the garden to compost and grow more vegetables and here's some background on that so here at Deluvui Community Garden, we grow produce for the tribe's elders nutrition program. Um, we have a variety of produce here, um, ranging from leafy greens, uh, tomatoes and peppers, um, different types of fruits from grapes to apples, blueberries and strawberries. Um, so last season we produced about 1,500 pounds. Um, we got um, a donation of vegetable starts from a local organic farm that really helped us um, really bump up our production. Um, and then this season we've gotten another donation from the same farm, so that's again helping us out. Um, we've also started a bunch of seeds, of course, ourselves here in our, mini, in our little mini greenhouses. Um, and so we've really been able to produce a lot for the nutrition program. Uh, this season we're focusing on more dark leafy greens, collards, kale. Um, we're also doing um, lettuces, um, ranging from spring mix to more um, lo larger loose leaf lettuce. And then we're also working on getting our high tunnel greenhouses in production so that we can extend our season. Um, we're looking into potentially doing stuff like more tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, peppers, maybe some eggplant. And I'd personally like to start getting in on some citrus and maybe figs. Some of the benefits of having this community garden here um, as a resource for the nutrition program, um, one of the main ones is you know, you have control over the means of production. So you, we have the ability to say, you know, we want to follow these growing practices. We want to make sure that we're not using any um, chemical fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Um, we're able to choose exactly what crops we want. Um, we can grow them um, as we need to the amount that we need. And then of course, there's the benefit of pro uh, proximity to the nutrition program. The kitchen where the meals are prepared for the program is right across the street, walking distance. So I come in in the morning, first thing, I pro, you know harvest bags of produce, I walk it over, it's rinsed, it's in the fridge, it's ready to go. So you know you're saving 
uh, money on delivery and then you're reducing the um, fossil fuel footprint um, of the produce that we're getting. We're not shipping stuff, all of our produce in from say the Central Valley or something. By having this community garden here, um, it really does support food sovereignty for the tribe. You know, the tribe has the ability to grow its own food on its own property. Um, it can choose, the tribe can choose what it wants to grow here, um, so it can decide to focus on larger, or um, it can choose to focus on high value crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, or it can focus on, as I've said, uh, more of the uh, produce that's specifically for the Elders Nutrition Program. We've got a bunch of different projects going on from our compost system that takes food scraps from the Elders Nutrition Program and from the Tribes Casino um, restaurants and turns that into soil for the garden. So one of the main benefits of composting is um, you're reducing the waste stream of the property of the rancheria. Um, we're reducing the quantity of materials that are going to local landfills and so uh, that's a really big plus. The more we can keep that on site and turn it into something useful, um, it's really good. It's good for us, it's good for the community at large, um, and it's good for the environment. And of course composting is great for the, um, the more, uh, shall we say, very local environment of the garden itself. We're incorporating all this nice organic material, all these nutrients into the soil, really improving the soil health and biology. One of the biggest benefits of having the community garden here is um, not just the nutritional benefit, but the community benefit that it serves. Um, really as a, as a gathering space where people can not only be producing their own food, but also learning about how to do so. Um, you know, we're starting to offer workshops here at the garden in a variety of different agricultural topics. And so we really want to turn this into a learning space, um, a gathering space where people can share ideas, where they can share knowledge, and uh, develop new skills that really allow them to support their own individual uh, food sovereignty. Uh, visit a video that uh, talks about the nuts and bolts of the food program that was started approximately 35 years ago when the need was uh, identified by the tribe. Yeah, and then during the, the pandemic, we were uh, able to expand our services to, we helped the neighboring tribes with meals. Um, we were able to provide them uh, with 500 uh, frozen meals for their area there in, uh, in Willow Creek. 
and then we uh sorry <laughs> and then there's a short video on uh, saying showing how we were able to help out in the Department of uh, OES also asked for our help with meals. During the pandemic, it was rather interesting. It's like our food production increased because there was a lot more uh, need. And then we were also contacted by the Hoopa Valley Tribe as their Title VI program was swamped with being able to fix meals for the elders that they were needing to. So uh, we were able to uh, provide meals for their, um, their program also. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here in that uh, all some of the takeaways I've got uh, from being involved in this is just the pleasure to be able to provide food for the elders in rural areas that uh, are not able to get their um, their own food or are too frail to fix themselves. And uh, having a, an efficient system to be able to do that, you know that it's um, it's properly made and, and taken care of so that there's less chance of the elders being getting sick from eating uh, things like that. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, fantastic. So amazing to see work that's not just promoting nutrition in your community, but also shows such great stewardship of our land and um, environmentally friendly practices. Um, so we are running a few minutes behind. I don't want to waste any time in introducing our next speaker. We would like to welcome Sang Yang from the Hmong Cultural Center of Butte County. Okay, thank you. Thank you and good morning, everybody. This is the same with the Hmong Cultural Center and thank you for the good introductions. Um, yeah, Hmong Cultural Center is about 70, um, um, 60 my north uh, Sacramento and I am today to present or to share with you our Zhongxia program, which is a community defined evidence practice for mental health for the Hmong community. Next slide, please. And this is the outline that I will share with today and a little bit about the California Reduction Disability because that's one of the project that <clears throat> funding and we also got the funding from the county before the, um, um, you know, the state as well. I will show with you a little bit about Hmong history and belief because I mean, in doing so, you will know um, where we are, where we came from and who we are. And then we'll go to the Zhongxia program uh, that and then I will share a little bit about the evaluation that we have with the Zhongxian and we will share a little bit about the impact of a pandemic for the Hmong community and the Hmong elder. So the Zhongxia program uh, will start uh, back to, um, you know, um, 2011 and, and then when the um, reduction disability project and over, we would like that to be support the Zhongxia program when the U.S. General Surgeon, the researcher was uh, talk about the talk about the uh, reduced mental health disability, and during the phase one, Hmong Cultural Center also participate with that um, to um, identify the community and to develop a statewide strategy for the five populations such as uh, African American, uh, Asia, Pacific Islander, Latino, and uh, LGBTQ, and the Native Americans. Next slide, please. I continue with that and then after the first phase we um, you know uh, be able to get the second phase the second phase of the CRDP is to uh, demonstrate and our community participatory evaluation process that select community defined evidence uh, practice 
um, for the community, um, community and to validate the program um, for the community and to get support from both um, the state and also the local county. And this also uh, support with the statewide uh, um, system policy and that reduce mental health disability among the unserved, underserved, and uh, inappropriate self in the population in the community. Next slide, please. And with that, we, um, well, the, um, you know, the program was start from um, the uh, 2018 and will end up in 2020. And uh, next year, we will have uh, all the project will have the, um, you know, activity on have the all the uh, data to disseminate for the public by 2022, uh, by next year. Uh, with the five population that we have total of 35 implementation pilot project. Next slide, please. Now, Mongolia Center, Spiel County is uh, one of the uh, partner of the um, of the pro um, other project. I don't share is the program. So we have both the statewide and the uh, statewide evaluator. We also have uh, the technical support and we also have the advisory committee with the, um, the agency and also local evaluate, evaluator that who is uh, helping us with the um, local um, evaluator. Okay, and this is a picture that we took uh, back to our really first uh, uh, annual uh, uh, committee um, and the really first year that we took them we put, uh, with all the IPP, the OE, uh, MU, TAP, and also our local evaluator as well. Next. Yeah. Well, um, you know, before talking to the pro, uh, Zhongxia program, this is uh, just wanted to give a little bit about the Hmong, the history and the background of the Hmong to, um, you know, so you know who we are and where we came from. Originally, uh, Hmong, we don't really know much about ourselves because we don't have the real language. But according to our trade back uh, to the our ancestor or immigration roots, um, you know our ancestor and, and you know we can trade back that uh, late um, 18th uh, or early 19th century, the Hmong was immigrant from China to Southeast Asia to Laos to Vietnam to Thailand and Burma, and in the 60s, and the Hmong was again involved with the Vietnam War. And the war in Laos is called the secret war because uh, it is a secret that, um, you know, not many people know of. And after the war, the Hmong will become a uh, political refugee or became a refugee to, uh, from 75 to, to, uh, to 90, late 90. And the really last wave is 2005 to 2010. That's the really last wave for the refugee that the Hmong came to the United States and many other countries. And this is some picture that's to sh uh, show that what, what, what you really see from the uh, first picture, number one, that is in the general, our general Wang Pao, who is uh, the, well, considered the father of the Hmong. <clears throat> and, and he is with the one of the uh, CIA agents and during the um, battlefield. And the second picture, what you see is the blue light as the Healing trial, which the uh, North Vietnamese, uh, you know, they supplied the military supply to the South Vietnam to fight against the U.S. Um, you know, troop down there, and when they cannot go to the Vietnam, the the um, in um, you know uh, pass South Vietnam to North Vietnam, and they uh, enter to Laos to the uh, South. That's when the secret war was starting. Uh, because um, you know, Hmong was a recruit and to protect and the uh, three mentioned that the Hmong uh, did better as number one to protect, uh, to uh, fight against the North communist uh, supply, um, you know, military supply and that and number one, number two is to help rescue uh, U.S. Dow pilots from Vietnam and number three is to, um, you know, protect the U.S. radar in 
allows to ensure monitor um, you know, the activity was really going on and during that war. And number feature number three, you will see in the communist took when after the police took over Laos and go to number four, the monk became a refugee uh, to many other countries, including the United States. As each of us. And first, the monk immigrant to the United States who so came from um, you know, from Thailand, we uh, escaped from Laos to Thailand and then live in the camp and then, um, you know, process the paperwork and then go to many other countries. But we first came to the United States in late 1965 uh, uh, to uh, 90 and oh, to, to the uh, 80. And after the 80, the first you know, we came to the United States as a refugee to wherever our sponsor, who ever sponsor us, many of the church and many of the individual that who sponsor, they came to all over the United States. But because the expertise, the experience, and what we have a back, um, background and where we came from, um, you know, we would not be able to sustain uh, and to, um, you know, live in. Um, the environments. So we became a secondary immigration to California because uh, uh, everybody found and uh, know that you know, uh, California is a good weather and also is a good uh, place to do the crop and, you know, to be a farming. So farming is our expertise and experience that we uh, have in the um, in back in Laos and Thailand. So that in the early 80s, um, you know, a lot of uh, mom um, you know, have a secondary immigration uh, from all over the United States to Fresno, to Fresno especially to California to do a farm. Next picture, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. A Zhongxia program is a program that was, uh, you know, created back in the uh, 2011, uh, which is funded by the county of Mental Health. And we were serving uh, the monk elder who is eight, uh, who is four, uh, 50 or older, and uh, which we also do serve uh, any uh, un uh, under than uh, 50, but uh, have to be referred from uh, either the um, physician, uh, the doctor, or also the um, behavioral department, so we can serve that. So, next. So, um, overall, the Rongxia activity, and this is the, uh, you know, one activity that we're going to prevent and reduce the mental health problem, uh, issue and isolation among the Hmong elder, and strengthening uh, the community social engagement, uh, because um, we uh, have uh, the elderly pretty lack of a social engagement. They don't speak the language and they don't uh, know how to drive. And, you know, there are so many layers of barrier that they cannot uh, socialize. So this is the only uh, program that will have them socialize and, uh, you know, out of the house to improve both psychological and spiritual mental health. And also uh, to increase access to culturally and linguistically appropriate mental health serve in the community. And this program is a design culturally meaningful to the Hmong elder here in Deep County. Next slide, please. Uh, in the Hmong, we do have a, a, our own belief. In traditional belief, we believe that, um, you know, we believe that our um, a shaman is really a, um, a, some, uh, a person that will really help us. And, you know, we, and so we do have the you know, traditional belief recreation uh, group for the program and uh, Don D meaning field trip. We took them to uh, a place that they want to go uh, or a place that they haven't been there. A community garden, a community garden is something that, um, you know, they're really good and expert here of and when they uh, do the garden that uh, is release and the stress and helping them uh, coping with the mental health. We also refer resources and connected to the community and within a management uh, or direct serve uh, for the community, uh, for our elderly as well. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
what traditional belief and we the monk be, we believe animism and we believe that all living and non living things have a spirit and that's how we believe um, um, you know often when our parents took us to the jungle to us to uh, a lake and they often don't they and often they say to the kid that don't throw any rock to the water don't throw any rock to the jungle because you don't know what's going to be there and um, you know, don't throw any rock. And often that said to us that a, a human, we do believe that we have a three soul and many uh, spirit. Um, you know, when a person is sick, because we believe that because their soul is no longer with your body, that's why you, we do become the sick. A shaman is the one person that who will balance the healing and he or she will be the one that will be able to communicate or bring back the spirit to you know, the body so we can get help um, uh, in spiritual side. Next slide, please. What the uh, activity, what we didn't, what we have, it's, uh, you know, we have a two side, both Oruga and Chico. It's from Oruga to Chico is about, um, you know, um, 18 miles apart. And with the activity that we have, we have a five topics for the activity. We have a physical activity. We have a cultural activity. We have mental, mental health and health um, activity. And we have a life skill. And that's what we have for that. Just, um, you know, back to where we came from, the parent, uh, our elderly is working a lot of um, outdoor in the farm. And, you know, they have a really good activity, uh, I mean, outdoor activity and physical activity, but because um, we live in this country, uh, we don't have a place for the elderly to do the activity and they pretty much stay home. All their family is working and the elderly stay home all day long, all week long and all months and year. And that has caused a lot of stress and that also caused, uh, you know, um, uh, issue, uh, health issue, all those that you can name off. And each exercise or each section or lesson just lasts for a week and seven weeks for the activity and one week for pre and post for the uh, activity which is to um, ensure that uh, how uh, or how they can help with the activity and that's what we have for that. And next slide please. And this is a, a picture that we have, you know, we took uh, our elderly to the trips um, and have them walk, uh, you know, with a trip to Reading. This is a uh, Turtle Bay in Reading and, uh, you know, a local farm. And we also went to, uh, you know, the Bay Area, such like what you see on the top one, right on the left, the top left, uh, the top right, and that it's, uh, um, we went to the San Francisco Zoo and many of those uh, elderly have never been in San Francisco or see the Golden Gate, which is a, they heard about, but they haven't seen. So we took them to those places that they want to go and they want to see. Next slide, please. Garden, yes, um, you are mentioned earlier, our parents, they really participate for the garden. This is a community garden with the staff and with the parents. Often our staff is younger um, you know, staff and they don't know much about the garden. Our parents who are the one that who guide us and who help us to do the garden. We have the right, we have corn, we have uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, elk plants, we have all kinds, chili, all kinds of food that you can name off. And uh, when they, it's time to harvest, uh, we, uh, we have uh, over 80 uh, elderly participants and they can come and, you know, we can distribute for them, distribute to the community and also we will uh, cook for the um, 80 people to come to uh, have them, um, you know, enjoy the food because in Hmong we do have a normal, normal lecture with uh, either new crop. Um, every year we did that. So this is something that um, and the parents uh, are participants really like it and they really want to, this to continue because something that they're really expert of. Nice. 
Uh, this is a physical activity, uh, like I mentioned earlier, because, uh, you know, often we, the elderly, they don't really um, have a place to go. So this is a place that for them to come to do the exercise, um, you know, to ensure that their well-being is well. So what you really see here is the physical activity. Next slide. This is a cultural activity. You see the turkey during the turkey time, we uh, talk about, um, you know, the story of turkey and have them trying the food, uh, you know, like at the um, turkey and something like that. And also we'll, you will see we have the, um, they make the custom, the head that is uh, for the Hmong New Year, they wear the custom during the Hmong New Year or during our event. And that is the culture and they also share the story of the culture, they share the, share the story of uh, and the background to the whole group. Okay, next slide. Life skills. Life skills often lead because we, uh, back to where we came from, uh, life skills is different than here. Uh, we often teach them how to, um, you know, um, work on their uh, medication because often the, this elderly, uh, a lot of time, each individual have a more than um, two, two or three medication and they have to take it every day or every week. And that's the kind of education that we give to them, you know, do exercise, eat a good food, and also and, uh, follow your doctor's, uh, you know, prescription, take a medic medication, um, you know, making sure the medication is safe, go into some safe place that you will be able to reach. All those are the activity for the life scale that we give to them. Also, we teach them how to say, uh, really basic, we say hello, uh, you know, really basic, you know, they'll be able to talk, uh, communicate with their um, uh, doctor and you know, physician uh, when they have an uh, appointment with the, uh, you know, uh, own physician. Next slide, please. Yeah. And this is the mental health. Mental health is, uh, you know, often in the monk, we don't have the term mental health. Now, uh, literally, when you translate the mental health into monk, that's a, um, you know, say, uh, you know, when we translate that, say, uh, CLU, and then when you translate the CLU into mental health, that means crazy. And when you talk about that, often we don't really talk about the mental health in the Hmong community. And we don't have that word um, before coming to the United States. And this is a new term for us. And uh, even though they do have a mental health, but our community don't really talk much about mental health because that is a term that, um, you know, it's, it's a term that we don't want to talk, <laughs> say crazy. <laughs> Okay, next. All right, and that's pretty much the long share program. And we do have the evaluation, uh, you know, the evaluation, the states uh, and also local and uh, uh, will, um, you know, do uh, both the pre and the post uh, for each participant. And, you know, we'll collect that. And we'll also do the interview, the focus group for the elderly for the program and for the community as well. Uh, we want like to know um, how how they see and what do they think about the program. And uh, this is the work we collect. And also the um, activity uh, or topics that we uh, cover that also have a pre and post. And other than that, we do have the story, um, you know, storybook, which each individual, they write their own story, um, you know, their journey from Laos to Thailand to the United States. And, something like that. So we also collect that to uh, collect as a book to um, you know, share with the community and share with uh, all the organization or other, um, you know, group as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic was the impact the Hmong community. And uh, this is what we see in the Hmong community is fear, uh, you know, depression, worry, uh, trigger the PTSD, the stigma, and isolation, lonely, um, you know, uh, language and technology. That's a huge issue that we have transportation and service because during this time, um, you know, this could put it pretty tough. For example, and I give an example that a mom family, but we have a quite a lot of family. We have the grandma and grandpa. We have the parents, mom and dad. We have about five or six kids. And when you add the five or six kids to 
um, um, you know, grandma, grandpa, and then they total over 10 plus, um, you know, uh, people live in a house that, um, you know, three or four bathroom, uh, it, it's pretty tough, you know, when the kids not going to school and the house is small and it's a pretty clown, and, you know, uh, all of this, this is what we, uh, you know, see, we saw, and we have experience for the, our community and issue and also um, awfully for the elderly and for the One Cultural Center, we did a lot of a translation for the, um, you know, such like the um, um, uh, uh, distinction, uh, uh, you know, um, that for the community to ensure that they will protect themselves, we distribute a lot of uh, masks and we distribute a lot of uh, hand sanitation to the community and we want the community to be safe and doing that and we want them to um, make it sure don't really go outside or you know join the pretty large group and also during the pandemic you we also know that a lot of things are happening to the um the um, particularly for the asia community uh, uh, that too and that is something that we really give a huge education to our community to ensure that uh, they were safe and to make sure that when the elderly are home, make sure the door is locked and something like that. And when I talk about the technology, our elderly don't really have a really, really little or non uh, technology. You know, uh, when this happened, when the uh, family don't come to visit the elderly, they will stay home and they only have the flip phone and, you know, they uh, only talk on the flip phone, they don't really see their uh, family, um, you know, for months or for a week or something like that. And when our staff have a chance to visit or to drop by something, um, you know, they cry and they say they really want to go see their family. They really want them to come visit because they were so lonely and, you know, something like that. And this is it happened in our communities. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, you know, uh, uh, three things that I want you to take away from today is, uh, um, you know, uh, know that there is a mom in the United States. And <laughs> just uh, remember, take the word mom. And also the don't share. Don't share is a program in Happy. And that is, if it's possible, you can say don't share, that would be good. And also, where to say the word nha zhong, meaning hi or hello, and hua chao, also meaning thank you. And that's just something that I would like to take from today because, uh, you know, it might be good if you can just take a one, say, don't share program or oh, happy program. That's, you know, uh, something that you take from today or the mom. Or uh, remember, say nha zhong when you see you have a chance, you are giving your agency serve the mom, um, you know, community might be good to learn the nha zhong and wa chao and you know, when you see them say nha zhong and when you live just say wa chao so i think that's pretty much why i have next like this okay and yeah thank you and that's pretty much why i have we have the uh, contact information and email on the website and feel free to go visit our website or email and i would like to thank you for the opportunity for today Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you, Sang or Guang Xiao. Um, I'm very pleased to see your services and the programs you've put together that aren't just focusing on individual health, but also community health, wellness, physical, and um, mental. Um, we do have some time to decide for questions, although we are behind. We're going to stay after for a few minutes in case we have any that we haven't answered yet. I do want to remind everyone that you can access resources related to equity at our Equity and Aging Resource Center, but we do have some rural specific resources for age friendly planning in our Master Plan for Aging's local playbook. So if you visit the mpa.ca.gov website, you'll find our local playbook. I'm going to hand it over to CDA Director Kim McCoy Wade to uh, wrap us up and also to facilitate our questions. Thank you. Uh, I am so uh, overwhelmed with gratitude for the presentations and the discussion. I will thank you for those of you who have asked questions in the uh, Q&A feature. 
And those of you who have answered, I see there are a few more for saying if, if you can stay with us. Um, saying, are you able to see Brandy Jones' question? How do you recommend reaching out to Hmong farm workers and in rural communities uh, for things like research for needs assessment? Yeah, that's that's uh, something that's a pretty tough to, for us too because uh, um, you know we do we do know uh, we haven't you know we talk a lot to the community that it's, it's that is something that we still um, try to what we can do right now we're partnering with the Fresnel is uh, uh, one of the organization Fresnel that are in the process and are writing a grant to um, you know. Um, working with the farming and, you know, in, in, in the month. So because the experience and the education that we have our background and to reach out to the monk we have to be a little bit passionate and on that also, um, you know, um, trust is something that um, uh, we have experience in the monk community. Uh, maybe the first time, second time, third time, you might get that. For example, I give this thing, you know, often when you say, you see a monk, for example, you see a monk, they say, okay, I give you this to you, the fry, some of that, they say yes to you. And um, you know, that doesn't mean that they will come. Say yes, that's, that means that, oh, I, 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 heard, I heard something from your mouth. And I also got something from your hands. And so, yes, that's the something like that. That doesn't mean that they will commit, they will do it. So it's kind of like you will take a more time when you're working with the uh, educate or, or um, 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 rural uh, the monk for we got back to where we came from. We don't have an education and you know it's kind of like a little bit tough. So you have to, for example, um, the monk culture said that we work more than um, there are other uh, activity that we put it down to be able to reach out to the community, not just what we put it down in the paper. We, have to work more than that. Well, thing I, that, that might lead into the next question, which is about how vaccination efforts have been going in the Hmong community. And I would just follow up from CDA. Are there other things we could be doing to support uh, your and groups like yours work in reaching everyone with vaccinations? Yeah, for the vaccination, is, that's pretty tough because uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the technology is, is an, also an issue. Language is also the issue. And, um, you know, when you go make an appointment, so Hmong Culture Center, our staff help and make an appointment for the, our elderly and for the community. Um, you know, uh, it's, there is a uh, last question that which you have to follow through. There's a website that you have to follow through. And this is all the bill. Um, you know, we also have a, a um, small grant from the, um, uh, for the pub, um, for the California Public Health, uh, starting this month, we will uh, educate our community regarding to the technology and buy some other lap, uh, laptop, buy some other um, you know um, laptop to educate them how to work with that. So I think if um, you can help, including uh, our county, also helping us as well. But um, the language barrier and also some kind of education, we do have uh, some uh, hesitation that they don't want to take yet. So, um, you know, yeah, I think that we need more education to, to the monk and, and to be able to have them to take uh, the vaccine when it's their time. Deb, did you want to speak to the vaccination question? Um, I know Shannon just texted us that she needs to go meet with her board of supervisors, which is uh, absolutely understood. But would you like to comment on um, uh, how it's going with vaccination and how we could support your work? Um, yeah, we have a, a vaccination. We had a vaccination clinic, but we also uh, have partnered with United Indian Health. And every other Wednesday, it's free. People can come out to the trailer we have here on site at the Rancheria office and get a vaccine. And then we also have um, Monday through Friday uh, testing, um, COVID testing for free um, for those that uh, want to keep up on that and make sure that they're uh, still negative and such. Great. The, there's another set of questions here about oral health and dental health and connecting with dental health hygienists or other resources. 
Uh, do either Deborah or Sang, can you talk about how you um, meet the oral health needs of the people you serve? Well, for the oral health of the Mark Culture Center, I've been partnered with uh, First of Five for numbers a year, and we work pretty hard for that because um, back to uh, my previous jobs as a community worker for the uh, Zero to Five, so we found that every, um, you know, uh, three or five mom kids have a oral the health issue, and mm-hmm. that's a concern that we brought in. And what happened was with the um, first five, and we also got uh, uh, support from the first five to educate uh, the mom uh, parents and also um, to, to taking care of that and also to meet with the needs for the oral health. And we have been educating the mom community for the past um, uh, couple year, uh, five five or so year. To regarding for the oral health, but yes, we still and that is still pretty um, something that we need to going on because uh, even though we do that, uh, we also have that issue and also uh, a, a county like a big county, we have a really limited of the um, dental that who uh, to really and uh, be able to um, you know provide the service for the community because uh, you know you might have an um, appointment that might take about a uh, couple months to get on your, 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 your time, you know. I, of, I often mention that to the, uh, you know, the county as well, say, you know, well, what we can do to, to uh, what county can do to bring more uh, dental to, to um, you know, to the county. So that means we don't have to go travel all the way to Sacramento and we have to stay here in the county, spend here and uh, you know, living here and spend here, but we don't have to go our county to get that serve. And for the month, we win uh, a lot to our county to get serve. Deborah, what's the perspective from uh, the Rancheria? Yeah, um, we have a dental hygienist that uh, was on is on staff. At uh, she works in McKinleyville, but uh, also we partner again with being our tribe is so small, um, we partner with United Indian Health and they have dental services and such there and they're in Arcata, which is like taking, you know, consideration, uh, some folks that live way out farther than we do, it would take them, you know, most of the day to come in on the bus and have their appointment and then get back home. But there is, you know, transportation available, basic transportation available for them. They could also call the office here and we have, um, a uh, bus that we could um, pick them up and take them to an appointment. And also, I wanted to add that that uh, you know we have a mom, um, uh, you know, dentist was hired by all over hospital, and now we we have the um, you know we have a mom dentist, so he is pretty busy. <laughs> He's pretty busy, so so glad the all over hospital you know, you know have that, and he is a local. Uh, he used to grow here in the oral world and, and, and you know, when study abroad and coming back to serve the community, he's uh, well known by the community. So, uh, so glad to have him. Well, well, that is a wonderful um, way to end because what your answers have just, you know, so many, so many connections, the intergenerational whole family connection, that first five partnership, uh, that was a big uh, priority of our master plan for aging, as well as the pipeline. How do we diversify our providers, our dentists, Uh, to have expertise in aging as well as be culturally competent and linguistically fluent. So um, all of those answers and of course transportation, the issue you can't talk about rural communities and not talk about transportation. So um, we're going to end it there. I want to thank all of you and a special thanks to our ASL interpreters for going over our time. We just had so much to talk about (laughs) and so much to learn. Um, As our project director, Amanda Lawrence says, there will all of these resources on the intersection of aging with equity, including rural communities will be shared, will be on our website. And we'd like to continue to be in dialogue and collect more. Uh, And ultimately we want every community in California to have a master plan for aging that fits your community, that fits Butte County, that fits your Anteria, that fits your region, uh, building on all of the strengths that we've heard about, all the beauty that, uh, and traditions that we've heard about, uh, but also meets the urgent uh, and significant needs we heard about as well. So we're here to partner and support with you and just so grateful for this chance to connect and learn and, and, do, and build back better as our governor says together. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you.